Kant was very deeply convinced that there is such a thing as moral action. Moral action means that a man chooses or can choose to do right as opposed to wrong, to put it in very simple terms. And that there was no merit in choosing what was right unless there was a possibility of choosing what was wrong. And if man was totally determined, not only by external factors, biological or physical, but also by what might be called internal factors, psychological, for example, his desires, his wishes, his inclinations, then, according to Kant, he was a mere turnspit, as he called him. He was like a clock, which, of course, moves in a perfectly regular fashion, but not determined by itself, but determined by some mechanism over which it has no control. What he was really opposed to was Spinoza's idea that a stone, which is flung by somebody, if you ask it why it is flying where it is flying, supposing it were conscious of what it was doing, might answer that it was doing so because it wanted to. But in fact, it can't help it. It's really the thrower who determines its direction. For Kant, this cancelled morality altogether. He thought that this was true of the physical world, but if it was true of the moral world, then goodbye to morals. For him, morality consisted in the power of choice. This does raise the very interesting question, though, doesn't it, when you deal with uh, those who are considered to be criminally insane, that is, they are mad, bad, uh, and therefore curable, and those people who are just bad, who are just criminals, and are seen to be responsible for their actions, and therefore are punished for those actions. I don't know whether it's, if you're considered to be totally incurable, then of course you are more or less regarded as a kind of medical object whether you were put in jail or in hospital, I think that isn't quite perhaps the division which one ought to draw. The division is between people who think who, whose acts are supposed to be caused by environment, by bad education, by other uh, factors which can be adjusted by a kindly and wise psychologist or sociologist, as, as it were, and acts which are regarded as, in some sense, free for which the man is responsible. And the whole notion of responsibility is at stake. Kant, whom I mentioned already, took a very extreme position about this. He thought that punishment was fundamentally retributive, which is now regarded as the most brutal and irrational position by many liberal-minded and progressive thinkers. He thought that because he thought that the idea that punishment is corrective, or the idea that punishment is educational in character, and alters your character, is insulting to the man himself. In some sense, the uh, corrector the psychologist, is regarded as a man who knows what is good for the man which he himself does not. And therefore he's being treated like a sick man or a child. This may be required in some cases where you are dealing with children. There's the ungrown up people who are not fully aware of the facts, who are in some way not adult, or perhaps people who are really aberrant, that's to say, who are psychologically in some way, as we would say, pathological or abnormal. But to regard all human beings as being in that condition, appears to him to deny what he regards as the most human of all human attributes, which is the power of free choice. And he says, in effect, that generosity, for example, and paternalism, even used for the most noble purposes, can be an insult to man, can be a form, terrible form of tyranny, that indifference, um, even hostility, recognizes the equality of the person towards whom you are hostile or about whom you are indifferent more deeply than the attempt to condition him, to mould him, to do something to him, um, which he is regarded as incapable of doing himself. I mean, I've known people who've committed antisocial acts who are quite clear about the fact that they'd rather go to prison than to hospital. To go to prison means that they, at least they know there is a punishment attached and they've done it all the same. They know perfectly well that society is against it. They may be agree with the laws of society and defy them openly, or they may disagree with them and think the laws are immoral or wicked. But at least they know what they're doing, they do things with their eyes open. As opposed to being sent to hospital, the imp implication of which is that they are in some way psychologically feebler, inferior to, understand the world less well than the people who are in charge of them. This would be true of the homosexuals particularly. Yeah. We, yes, and while there were anti-homosexual laws in England, certainly some homosexuals I've met were proud people who said they knew what they were doing, and they would rather be punished than treated as pathological cases. How often do you think that this argument of, about human nature, that is, a collection of people, sit down and decide, this is human nature, this is what we can expect from man. Mm -hmm. On the side you have what is natural for man, and you have what is unnatural. So, to be a homosexual, to come under the heading of any other number of aberrations, you are unnatural, and therefore, to be cured, 
to be coerced into naturalness. Well, of course, I mean, one must begin by saying that some very dogmatic and some very crude views of human nature have been held and have done a great deal of damage. If you thought uh, diabolical possession was very important, uh, as you did in the Middle Ages, then when people behaved in perhaps hysterical fashion, they were beaten. They were beaten and they were maltreated in order to drive the devils out of them. It took some time for people to realize that perhaps the causes of such behavior, whatever they might be, were not supernatural in character, and therefore that the treatment advocated by religious persons uh, were uh, mere cruelty. Yes. But at the same time, I have to say, all moral theories and all political theory rests on some view of human nature. In the end, it boils down to that. When you compare this morality to that morality, this moral philosopher to that moral philosopher, or this society to that society, if you research sufficiently, scrupulously and deeply, you will find that there is some concept of human nature which underlies it. And there have been several concepts which have clashed with each other. For example, in the ancient world and in the medieval world, in the Judeo-Christian world, so to speak, and indeed in the ancient Greek world too, it was assumed that all things had purposes. Inanimate objects, animate objects, men, all had some kind of inbuilt purposes. If you were a theist, you believed that God created you for a certain purpose. If you were not a theist, you talked of nature. Not necessarily as creating, but being, filled with objects with certain purposes. The great thing was to discover what is the purpose of a stone. The purpose of a stone is to gravitate downwards. For Aristotle, every object seeks its natural end. That's called teleology. If you think that everything has a proper purpose, then you say, full realization of an object or a person is the attainment of that particular end. And that's what makes people happy. Why are people miserable? Because they don't understand their ends, and they try and do something for which they're not adapted. I am a violin player, and I try to play the flute. That's no good. I wish to construct a violin, I try and make it out of stone, it will not yield, because I don't understand the purposes of stones, the purposes of violins, or my own purpose as a player. And this, of course, is also the Christian idea of a kind of hierarchy, which God is at the head, and the Pepsi Amoeba, when it is discovered is below, and there is a whole hierarchy, so to speak, of beings, each of which seeks to attain its own purpose, and if they all attain their purposes, they're in harmony with each other. Disharmony arises when people wander away from their purpose through error, through blindness, through perversity of some sort, through misfortune sometimes, perhaps. And then they have to be put right, adjusted, put into a proper bracket, mm. so to speak, and then it's all right. And people like Hume, who was highly empirical, still believed something not unlike that. He thought there was a nature, mistress nature, dame nature, which always came to one's aid when one was in some way distempered. Hobbes did not believe this on the whole. Uh, Spinoza didn't believe it. This was a great break. The idea that things don't have ends, the only people who have ends are men who make things for certain purposes. Clocks don't have ends, the, the end is imposed by me. Um, men don't have inbuilt ends, they simply seek what they seek. When they're rational, they seek rational ends, and if they're irrational, they seek irrational ends. If you understand what the world is like, you will see what is likely to compass your ends, what is likely to fulfill them, and what is likely to frustrate them. But it's a, there's a terrible, complete contrast between people who think that there are objective ends built into things and men, and people who say things are what they are, they're simply a mechanism. They just exist and are causally determined. And ends are things which human beings just conceive and can abandon. Where does freedom, though, where does, where does the sense that man is a self-actualizing entity? This is the Sartre argument, isn't it? Well, certainly it is. That, of course, is what Kant is in favour of. That's where it comes from. It comes from Kant and Fichte and these German philosophers, for the most part. Though there were people in the ancient world, Epicurus, I think, probably thought that we were free in some way. All determinist theories flow from the Stoics, and all libertarian theories flow from the Epicureans, historically speaking. You see, the Stoics are the first people who really saw the dilemma, the awful agony. They were the first people who, on the one hand, believed that there were certain things which people had to do. I don't say they called them duties, but things which were proper for men to do, and therefore they had to choose. On the other hand, they also believed in rigorous causality, and they didn't know how to get out of this. They were the first people to be in this bind. And I, one of them then says, well, we can solve it this way. We can say men are involved in this. They're not just pushed about by external causes. If a sphere rolls down an incline, the fact that it rolls down the incline is due not merely to the incline, but also to the fact that it is spherical. When men act in certain ways, it isn't only that they're being pushed by external causes, it is also they have a certain character. They're involved, their nature, they're involved in it. If they're involved in it, they're free. Kant rejected this absolutely, said this was a miserable subterfuge. Either you were determined or you were not. The fact that you were determined by your own nervous system or by your own emotions or by your own desires didn't make you any freer. Uh, but he and people like Sartre certainly suppose that this whole metaphysical notion 
of everything being rigorously determined, whether by empirical causality or by some kind of metaphysical structure, was simply something which human beings invented, at least for Sartre, in order to justify all kinds of acts which they fundamentally suppose not to be right. Also, it seems that it does justify the structure of society as well, doesn't it, very nicely. The view of a hierarchy, a concept that everybody has their place, that human nature, uh, God or whatever it is, history, has determined that people will have a particular function. Then you have your people at the top and your people in graduated classes down to the very bottom. Now, this does form a very good justification for injustice, inequalities, and things of this sort. Well, uh, perhaps for justice too in some cases, but the thing is that it's cosier that way. If you aren't fully responsible for your own acts, if you can say, I am as I am because my parents maltreated me, I am as I am because the nature of the universe is such, and it, then you put the responsibility on the back of the universe and shuffle it off your own. And this, ultimately, people don't want to be all alone, the big lonely persons responsible for their own acts. They want some justification of what they do from the nature of something greater, more stable, in a way grander than themselves. And if they can say, I fulfill the will of God, or I fulfill the will of history, or I fulfill the will of my class, or I understand myself to be a member of a certain economic stratum, let us say, which I didn't choose, but uh, with which I'm deeply bound up, which I cannot, in a sense, help and don't want to help, because that's what I am. In, in this sense, that really, the sociologists are right to a degree, aren't they, that, in fact, many of the ideas, and probably the majority of our ideas, are formed to justify, to rationalise the functions which we have in society. That is, they're thrown up by society. They're not uniquely divined notions that an individual arrives at, but they are ideas which are formulated by the society in order that the individuals will be able to act, and that the ideas come, in a sense, after the action, and don't precede it. Well, uh, there's obviously much truth in this, and not, I don't think it's unconsciously. I don't, don't think this justifying activity is done by a lot of unscrupulous knaves who simply throw dust in people's eyes in order to make them do what they want them to do, although Voltaire thought something like that. I dare say there have been cases of that. But broadly speaking, what one can say is ideas are not born in the void. Ideas are not born of ideas. There's no pathogenesis among ideas. Ideas are, to a large extent, the products of the social process. I'd be the last person to deny that. Take, for example, nationalism, which is uh, one of the most rampant ideas at present in the world. Yes. Who can deny? Well, this is, to a high degree, the product, for example, of... I suppose, humiliation on the part of the weak by the strong, which ultimately leads to a backlash, which ultimately leads to a kind of what Schiller and other people have called the bent twig theory. If you bend the twig too far, it lashes back. Well, th I don't think they're conscious of that. I think if you talk about nationalists, they don't say, we've been humiliated, we've been pushed aside, we've not been given our place in the sun, and that's why we feel so resentful. We are poor and we hate the rich because we're poor. We have been weak, and that's why we hate the strong, because we're weak. They just feel these emotions, which are undoubtedly caused in them by some kind of socio-psychological process. In a sense, then, we are determined... To a large degree. <laughs>